But An Nguyen is a Vietnamese-born uh, Amer American now. Um, he um, was in Hue. His house was a block from the MACV headquarters in Hue City uh, during Tet of 68, a hot spot. And um, he knew that something was happening when bullets were coming through his house. Um, that was his wake-up call. Uh, he was able to get to the States in 1974, was sponsored, uh, went to the University of Penn State University, finished a degree, worked for several companies, ended up spending many years with Coca-Cola and uh, became an executive of Coca-Cola and started the first um, enterprise for Coca-Cola in Hanoi, in Vietnam, and worked as the plant manager there, uh, managed that operation for about six years. Uh, while he was there, he had some great opportunities to meet with some of the uh, former NVA uh, high-level officers. They had an interesting perspective on the war, different than ours, you might think. And uh, so he has a lot to say, and we're only giving him three and a half hours, and then we've got to stop. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, would love to have him here. Welcome him for me, please. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for allowing me today to share with you, with all Vietnam vets that I always admire and deeply appreciate it for all the service in my country. Okay. Again, my name is An Nguyen, and my family and I, we proud to call beautiful America home since 1975. About two weeks ago, my dear friend John, Mr. Butler, asked me to give a talk to share my humble experience as a 13 years old kid and my perspectives during the Tet Offensive in 1968. Without hesitation, my answer is yes. And it is my honor and my duty to come here to talk to you and to tell you how much in debt of myself, my family, and other thousands and thousands of Vietnamese families for the sacrifice of American fighting for us during the Tet Offensive, 28 days of carnage. Just a little bit about me. I was born and raised in Hue City from the family of 10. I arrived in U.S. in 1974 through a sponsorship by my brother-in-law, great man, Bill Fleming. He was at the State Department at the time, working in Hue City as senior economic advisor. In May 1975, after the Vietnam War ended, they turned me into Vietnam, Vietnam refugee and gave me a green card and a social security. I, uh, I was a little bit concerned because I don't know what to do because I have no home to go back to, and all of my family still remain in Vietnam. I was in California, and since I was by myself, my brother's-in-law family sponsored me. So from California, I driving up to Philadelphia and to be with them, which I call my mom and dad. 
my first job was at Mako Auto Painting, and also start to go back to school as a full time. And during my junior year at Penn State, I was lucky to get a job at the time for the Philadelphia Coca-Cola bottling companies. Even though as a janitor, but I'm so happy because I know my career will be with that companies. And thank God that, that he gave me a time and a place where I can be able to grow, learn, and retire from coke. I became U.S. citizen in 1990. My mom and dad, Fleming, come and so proud to wave American flags together. After graduated from Penn State, they moved me into the Yako Metal Management Trainees, which is it's a good a program. And I was been doing very well in many different positions and get promoted to production manager in 1994. That is a time when my career take a turn where the Coca-Cola company asked me to go back to Vietnam. I was nervous and happy at the, at the same time. And I asked my brother-in-law, Bill, how to proceed with my decision. He said, "On the Vietnam War is over. The time for us, like I tell John earlier, that we will provide them with carrots instead of stick. So that's, that's how I goes. I retired from Coke in, 19, in 2014, and now I am a consultant, do some consulting work for Coca-Cola, as well as on the board of directors for Coca-Cola Alumni Association. So what is TED? In Vietnam, Tet is a New Year holiday, the biggest holiday of the year. And this is where my story began as a 13 years old boy. It's a national holiday, just like Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year roll into one. On Tet holidays, we would have the feast of the morning of the first day. And they also throw in a national happy birthday to everyone from small to big. And that I just become a 13 years, years old boy at the time. Like any other kids, the Ted New Year New Year's was all about new clothes, toys, life, love, happiness, and dreams. My city of Hue was a peaceful and beautiful city. A Vietnamese cultural center in Hue, the econ economy was very good. Business booming with four activities of a mixed Vietnamese, Americans, military, and economics advisor and developments. As for Hue's citizens, we were happy, thrives, and full of lives. Our family and home business located in Highway 1, in the south side of Perfume River. It was a very busy business area with many commercial shops and an open market. It was also a key highway for U.S. Marine and Army combat base that every day up and down on Highway 1. And every day they shower with us with old candies. And many times I chasing them for more candies, especially the one with us at, at the time as a boy, 
chocolate candies was the best. So thank you. <laughs> the, the war we known is far distant away. The closest we heard about fighting was in Kazan, which is near Laos border. We never knew or heard of any shooting or fighting in our city. Everyone was prepared, happy, and ready to welcome the Tet New Year's, called the Year of the Monkey. However, this all changed on the morning of January 31st, 1968, or the first day of Tet. As I opened the windows on my third floor, I was greeted with a burst of gunfires and followed a screaming voice ordered me to close my windows. Across the, across the street, I could see the vehicle preparing by digging their trenches, hiding in their bunkers between houses and inside open market. And, a, and a, through a loudspeaker, a communist propaganda was being broadcasted. And within a few minutes later, we realized the Viet Cong occupied Wei City. As the situation sinking in with my family, and the whole neighborhood were quiet, Around 9.15 a.m., I can hear the rumbling sounds that vibrate the street. I peek through the windows, and I saw a convoy of Marines, tanks, and trucks approaching Anchor Bridge, which is the front gate going to the MACV headquarters which is about 150 yards from my house. At the same time, with anti-tank rockets hiding behind the walls of an electric power station on the left side of the bridge, which is 50 feet away from the tanks and the trucks. But there was nothing I could do to warn the Americans, Marines. We were too far, and there was just no time for me to do anything. As the leading tank cleared the bridge, I saw a streak of smoke firing. The tank was shot and severely crooked by the ambush. Then all hell broke loose. The heavy machine gun fires started at all directions. After a few seconds, as the smokes became clear, I witnessed three marine, Marines jump up from the tank, were shot and killed, probably the first casualties of the Battle for Hue. As the Marines continued to move north, more heavy gunfights continued to erupt in front of our house. This lasted for another 40 minutes. They were under heavy gunfires from both sides of the highway, on the rooftops of the buildings and inside some of the government captures buildings. As the Marines take cover behind tanks on the street, you heard the voices of Marines screaming in agony and shouting in pain while fighting their way to MACV headquarters. Also, there are many casualties, civilian casualties, that lay both sides of the highway to the MACV headquarters. This lasts for 10 days, 10 days of constant heavy fighting right in front of our house. On February 11, 
my family tried to escape to Matvi compound for safety. However, Viet Cong intercepted us and ordered us to go east to a Buddhist temple. This area turned out to be a VC stronghold and a free fire zone. There was heavy shelling and bombing every day and night. We have to live through this terror and nightmare for another 10 days and constantly wondering if we would survive the next day, the next hour, or the next minutes. In the early morning of February 22nd, as the sunlight broke through the clouds, we saw several U.S. helicopters, gunships, flying very low and in pair along the river bank. We can see the pilots and the dual gunners waving at us with a smiling face. We were so relieved because there were no gunfire for more than two weeks. And it seemed like a two weeks, like eternity. We feel like we are in heaven, so graceful and ready to go home. As we approach back to our home in Hue, we joined by other several hundred Vietnamese also ready to go home. We were welcomed by U.S. Marines who stand guard both sides for us on the Highway 1. They waved and smiled at us, holding, holding up peace sign. It was the most beautiful sight we had ever seen. The heroism of U.S. Marines, the first air cavalry who liberated and saved Ray City. And I know some of uh, new, my new friends in this room show me about their experience in Hue. And I so thank you for sharing with us. God bless him, our family and others who had endured and survived a terrible battle. We alive and given an opportun opportunity to live again. Three days later, on Sunday morning of February 25th, 1968, it was a peaceful morning, except in a few gunfires from a distance away. Suddenly, I heard a beautiful church organ music from a short distance away. I then let my curiosity guide me toward a group of Marines kneeling down in the front of a man in military uniform with a red and white scar down to his neck. Standing next to the rumble, to the rubbles, on Anchor Bridge, which is destroyed at the time, right on the spot where three Marines were killed 25 days earlier. Their praying voices cut through my innocence of believing there is only one guy, it's my God. I asked my dad, can a preacher hold a service outside of a church or a temple? His answer, when your faith is strong and your conscience is pure, God will be arisen where you stand. He brings God to man, to his family, and to his country. What I have learned on that day 
was that the Marines, they never failed to carry out their duty, marching forward with courage and dignity, gave everything they got, did the best they could, and never leave their bodies behind. My family and I and all the thousands of Vietnamese family, we forever thank you thankful for their bravery, dedication, and sacrifice to service to our countries, Vietnam and America, and also to the humankind where you can see on the picture earlier that despite heavy fighting, they always reach out and rescue the civilian and also show them, show us to where the safety shelter. After that, the Marines occupy around my house and as I remember, and always remember, we always have a good time with the Marines. Many years ago, on a quiet evening, my beloved brother-in-law Bill Fleming and I, we visited the Vietnam Veteran Memorials to pay our deep respect and sorrow to over 58,000 names on that wall. Why I reached out and touched their names on the shiny black marbles, I still can hear their voices echoing from yesteryears. With his blessing, I have learned through the years and realizing that the sound of Marines screaming in agony and shouting in pain in front of my house were the sound of freedom, my freedom. And the sound of their praying in the middle of the robots in Uncle Bridge where were the sound of faith, my faith. Earlier, I believe that Bob introduced the new book. Okay, time to talk. As always, our great admiration for Bush soldiers, a great fighter and a messenger of countless noble service stories. There were over 58,300 stories need to be told, and one by one, Everyone in this room is their pain. For many, coming home wasn't easy. Some quietly planted in civilian clothes and some with courage in uniforms were only to be cursed at or spit on. The only ones remained faithful and proud were their families and their buddies. As we hear today, and I know in my, my memories as well as your memories, that for those who serve and sacrificed, I want to recognize and honor some of my friends and my heroes who are not with us today. Harry Duncan Williamson is U.S. Air Force Captain serving one tour in Vietnam and is my morning tennis team. Some years ago, I asked Duncan, you must be very brave to be a fighter, bomber pilot. He told me, no man. And then he tell me a story that one day he received an order to fly into a small strip outside of Pleiku to provide some relief and evacuate some Vietnamese civilian.
get caught in heavy fighting. Well, he said, it turned out to be almost a in his C-130 cargo plane. That includes dogs, cats, pigs, ducks, and all flying, flying them to safety. While flying back, he had the adjust fan blowing at full speed. I said, what a mess. And, he, and his answer, oh yeah, man. But the good news is that I will be scheduled to go home the next day. After a long battle, Duncan passed away last year on November 26. And before he passed away, a week before he passed away, I was there and talked to him. He told me, "On, I still appreciate the feedback from the story, and I don't realize that I have saved the poor people in Vietnam that I caught. Because I told him, without you, that all of them maybe get killed. And he just, the first time he told me that he felt appreciated. And he, were, he was so proud that we be able to talk because he kept keep the, keep the story to himself for a long time. And also, I would like to recognize a Vietnam War friends that still with us, still with me today, even though he doesn't like me to call him heroes, but I do it anyway because to me, he's a hero. Dan Lawton, he served in Vietnam in one tour in 1966. I call him Lieutenant Dan. Which is, his base is at Tainan near Cambodia borders. When Dan come home in 1967, he received two gifts. One was self stitched handkerchief and also a letter in Vietnamese by a high school teacher that he and his troops were often visit and, and given gifts during Christmas. So then come back very quiet person. I knew Dan for a long time, and I knew he was a Vietnam vet. But every time I engaged and talked to him, he seemed to be quiet and, and don't want to talk about it. Because to him, it was a painful. And later on, I realized that he was the one who was spit it on. So last year, 52 years later, Dan asked me to translate the letter into English. It was a beautiful letter. And at the, at the same time, during the last 52 years, Dan often asked himself, was it worth it? And after he read the letter, he felt the answer, yes. Intern internally, the peace had come and rest with him, within him and his family, 52 years later. And he wrote me a note to say thank you that his effort has been recognized. Not only himself, not only that he buried himself for the last 52 years, but now he say thank you, Aunt. 
because for the last 52 years, he just always thinking about what, what inside that letter. It's so sad that it took him 52 years. And I'm very happy to be his side when we read the letter together. Like I mentioned earlier, in 1994, they asked me to go back to Vietnam to reestablish Coca-Cola in Vietnam. I, say, I, I tell them, great, I want to go back to Saigon. They say, oh, no, you're going to Hanoi. <laughs> well, I am very scared, nervous. So the first items that I brought with me to Hanoi is the book wrote it by Joe Galloway and Harold Moore. Through the years, I tried to identify the NVA that Joe mentioned in his book. Finally, they all, they were all become my friends. And after a drinks or uh, over the dinner, they start open up and tell me about their side of the story. It was a convincing and compelling. But at the same time, we wonder that how the North that be able to fight against the French and later against us. So here is what they told me. And it's their side of the story. And I just uh, ensure that right, wrong, or indifference, but it's their perspective. So in 1945, Ho and Vaughn Nguyen actively working with us, OS, OSS, we call Dear Team, um, with Agent Patty and Lieutenant Thomas, and offer to work with us and provide, provide intelligence about the Japanese movement in Northern Vietnam. And in turn, they will, they will have an asset to our communication that go to our government. And also, during World War II, who is seeking US and allies, empathy of the French, Japan, Nazis collaboration in Vietnam that their collaboration with Nazi that allow almost two million Vietnamese die in starvation because of their troops, the French and the Japanese seized all the rice with thousand and thousand tons of rice from the south to the north. With that cut off, like I say, two million northern Vietnamese die of starvation. I heard is that the French cover up the story, and during the World War II, they don't want to be their colon colony or colonial power to be have some genocide occur under their watch. As World War II ended on September 2nd, Ho Chi Minh declared independence in Vietnam and used our independent declaration as their principle. And later on, he signed a letter with his bacon, Harry Truman, our president, 
for his intervention against, against the French and support Vietnam independence. Pass them declaration as the Vietnamese as the Japanese surrender in Vietnam. The British enter South Vietnam to disarm the, French, uh, the, the, the Japanese. The Chinese Chiang Kai-shek also asked to enter into northern Vietnam. However, their troops is so poor, they go to the rampage from anywhere from their borders to Hanoi, raping, killing Vietnamese innocent. Ho Chi Minh, he asked for U.S. support and also negotiate with the French to have the French back to Vietnam to stop the genocide by the Chinese. Well, you remember this Dien Bien Phu's battle. So May 7, 1954, the French surrender at Dien Bien Phu. After that, per Geneva Agreement, Ho and his polit members believed that President Charles de Gaulle misled U.S. on Vietnam's general election, of fearing a victor victory of Ho's, and therefore they determined to hold on to South Vietnam as a French colonial union. That North Vietnam has no natural resources, thus no economic benefit or interest to French economy. By giving, up, by giving up North Vietnam, the U.S. Will, will increase financial aid, weapons fighting against communists. That the South Vietnam, with the vast resource from France owns thousands and thousands of acres of rubber plantation, coffee and tea plantation, largest rice producer in Southeast Asia in Mekong Delta, and also an opium production in Central Highland. This will greatly benefit to French economy after World War II or post-war post economy. That is what the North believe till today that the reason why the French even get defeated in the Bien Phu, but yet they still want to hold on. And they use our support financially and weapons to protect their interests. So in 1956, no general election holds determined to finish the French and li liberate the South. Thus, will support the North Vietnam economy with all natural resources, relieve pressure from the conditions imposed by the Soviet and the China A's. Ho also views that the war against American or American war was fought based on two different principles or theories, which is the domino effects that Vietnam or them or their world Vietnam War was a political struggle for their identity and call for all citizens to pick up arms to drive general offensive and people uprising to liberate the country against the French and turn out later on US eco aggression. He said it was patriotism, not communists, that inspired the Vietnamese people. He said, you will kill 10 of us. We will kill one of you. But in the end, you will tire of it first. 
And with us American, that United States, a super nuclear power country, will use its powers of weapons to drive post-World War II with political will, establish new world order, advancing democracy, and market on the economy. So the power wheels in Vietnam, Westmoreland body counts, will determine its victory. We are killing the enemy at the ratio 10 to 1. But however, however political will by Senator Holland, Hollins and the media, he say the American people don't care about the 10, but they care about the one. I believe, and the North Vietnamese, North Vietnamese believe at the time, is that anti-Vietnam War is at its peak. And that's when his calculation, he and his period bureau, launch a Tet Offensive. That the calculation he willingly to take. That leading to the Mo Tung Tet Offensive changed everything. That American withdrawal in 1972 and the war, Vietnam War ended in 1975. And further, they tell me at the same time, they, got, they, they have a great admiration for American fighting in Vietnam. That American soldiers were fearless, brave, courage, and disciplined. Never failed to carry out their duty. They always marched forward regardless under fierce return of power, firepower by Viet Cong, never surrender and never leave their men behind. A formidable force that goes anywhere, fighting anywhere, jungle and all, and or urbans. Amazing mobility and live under extreme condition in the outpost, near the Kaisan base, Hill, Hamburger Hill, or many other Kong Tiang, uh, or in Anke, that they made themselves at home in the jungle. Whereas many of Viet Cong that don't even think about it, they marched down the Ho Chi Minh trails, but they were very organized. But however, they see that Americans start to establish their base. And that's when they stay overnight for many days or many months. And they asking themselves that a Westerner had enough brave to live and to fight. Also, they afraid of napalm bombs and gunship. Oh, I'm sorry, before that it was American awesome firepower. Viet Cong told me that they had only a few seconds to pop up from their foxhole or trenches to fire their weapons. weapons. Any more than that, the American will identify the location and return fire at a maximum rate. 1,000, 1,000 rounds per minute, most often near the get killed or injured. And also, they, they, they're very afraid of napalm bombs and gunship. Uh, napalm bombs create an awesome impact to surrounding area. The destruction and that preventing the Viet Cong to attack or to counterattack attack because they told me it's so hot and it's hard for, for, for a long time. And that will break the perimeter for them to neither attack or to counterattack. attack. 
the gunship, the helicopter of fixed wing, circling above with deadly five powers. The most effective were, were high power machine guns, cannons, rounds, and missiles. They're called phosph phosphorus, which is very hard, and most often that take them out of commission. And most often, most often, those require long, long term care or just uh, a, a long term uh, injury. And most often, that, that take them out of commission. So, with that, uh, as of uh, today, and I'm so happy uh, to hear with you today. And knowing that we all come here, so I know myself and you are honoring those people, friends, or I'm sorry, those Americans and your friends die for America. And we will always remember them, great Americans, with gratitude. Thank you, everyone. God bless you and your family. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, I know John just told me that we, we still have a few minutes uh, to have a Q&A. So I would love to hear from you, your pers perspective as well, your, your fighting. What happened to your family that you left that way? Well, in 1980, some of my, some of my family members be able to get out by boat, called boat people. And some, my mom and dad, were sponsored yeah. by my brother-in-law, through U.S. government and Vietnamese government. So all of my brother and sister arrived here safe. So alive and safe, so thank you. Gotcha. How many civilians did the NVA kill there in Hawaii? Uh, that is that's a good question because I asked the question with too many people until I got a certified answer because it was a massacre. And so the, the, the low count is about 3,000 and the high counts about 5,000. And one family victim was by relative. Um, it was a very sad, sad chapter in, 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 in Hawaii and in our history, or in, in, in Vietnam history, I'm, I'm sorry. Yes. Did many of your family go to the re-education camps? Yes, I have an uncle. He was a colonel in, in Vietnamese Airborne. He went to re-education re camp for 17 years. And I ask, and I ask, why? And one of the guy in the north told me, you know, um, when they liberate, they thought happiness, right? They thought that they have enough food to eat. And yet, all of that dreams is not true. So put my uncles in the re-education re camp as well as others is that at least they be able to grow some food and survive themselves 
without going to societies. And I thought well, is, that is a very, very uh, rude answer, an inhumane answer. Uh, but he doesn't recognize it. So, so luckily, my uncle will be able to come to the United States a few years ago. Mr. An Nguyen, my name is Hai Cao. I'm a your fellow Vietnamese. I just have one question. Uh, during the time of test offensive, for unfortunate, unfortunately, I was born and raised was born and raised in Saigon, so I didn't really have any. I'm about your age too. I didn't have any first-hand experience in the what so-called uh, bury alive of those people who was named by the communist invasion that they had to be killed during the third offensive. There are like thousands of people that buried alive in a big, uh, how you say, like to tomb. So I, my question is, because I didn't see that on your presentation, just want to see if you have your first-hand experience and you can comment on it. Oh, yes. Um my dad was, since earlier I mentioned that we were escaped to a village stronghold of Viet Cong. They captured my dad. And later on, my dad was a businessman with, among other people, when the South Vietnamese re-established the, 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 the security of the city, the people who's in the area where Viet Cong occupy that also go to jails. So back to your question, is that because when the Viet Cong taken over the Hay City, that information is relied on the local, or you call Viet Cong, you know, uh, sympathizer. They the one who is point the fingers to the Viet Cong and say he's a professor, he's a businessman, he's a captain in, 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 in Vietnamese army, or he's the police. Viet Cong don't know, don't care. They kill them all. So that's the numbers where it's up to 5,000. And many, many of them was buried alive. That's the, 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 the sad thing about that, it was to Viet Cong. Their hatred is so enormous that they rather save the bullets then kill the people, their enemies. That is the story where I try to search for an answer, and I don't get no answer from the North, because I know for sure that documentaries and the spies, as well as their Viet Cong, but they, they just don't want to, to, to evict that story or or, or also want to bury the story because not only me, many, many, including Americans, which is John McCain, which I met, um, through Ambassador Pete Peterson, I also there with me, and Ambassador Winston Law, I don't know if you know him, he's a, at the time during the Vietnam War, he was an assistant to Henry Kissinger. They raised the issues, the painful, but they refuse and blame it to anybody else, including the U.S. Yes, sir. Did you by chance uh, have the opportunity to watch the Ken Burns story about Vietnam? And if so, uh, how would you comment on it? Yes, I did watch the whole thing. And sadly, many small story of the people, 
they did interviews were high up politician I want to hear the normal the fighting men on the battles I have met Joe Galloway's Joe Galloway's my friends and I say Joe you were you were on that 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 can bones. and he said to me that I also disappointed because when they interview me, just a segment, but they don't let me see the whole thing before they release. So I am watched the whole thing, but at the same time, I I I, I am I was very disappointed because not enough voice, your voice. The people who actually fight and die, that never heard. So to me, Ken Burns is no different from any others. We is, I believe, maybe play into the North Vietnam or the, 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 the NVA or the, for, 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 for law. Um, Viet Cong narrative, and I, I just don't think that it reflect the true story about American fighting in Vietnam. Yeah. First of all, thanks very much for your being here today. Um, we empathize with you and your family during that very difficult and painful time. A number of us were also in that vicinity and, and during the Tet Offensive. A number of us uh, Saturday night went to dinner with representatives of the Vietnam American community. And I'm wondering, in connection with this group, if you have any suggestions or ideas about how this group and the Vietnamese American community might collaborate on some common endeavors that would be useful to the VAC and also to our organization? That, that, that is a great question. So when I was in Hanoi um, in 1997, I had a new boss. So I went to Hanoi Airport, pick him up. He was division president visiting Vietnam. So I pick him, pick him up at the airport, driving him through town and to his hotel. He, for the first day from the time we departure from airport to town, he said silence, don't even say a word. So I tell him that the next day I'm gonna pick him up. And he say, on, let's do it early. Because he want to see the Vietnam market as well as the people. So the next day I took him and driving in Hanoi and outside Hanoi to visit many of our distributors. And many of our Coca-Cola distributors what was or were owned by the high-ranking North Vietnamese Army because it's the time it's come back and, and that's the way the, 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 the state government say thank you to them. So my boss, big tall guy, very pleasant, shake hand, hold, hug, and promise that we're gonna help them through the ways. So that evening, I take him back to the airport. On the way back, and he told me, "On, you have to do everything you can to help these people." And I say, "Mr. McKenzie, on the way to from the airport to here, you don't say a thing. You very observant." And I say, "What? What is that?" And he told me. He served in two tours in Vietnam. And he tell me the war is over. 
we spill a lot of blood and tears in this country. As a Coca-Cola, we need to move on. However, he's saying, since I talked to many high-ranking Vietnamese official out distributors, they also recognize that Vietnamese Americans, they recognize that themselves as a Vietnam warrior, and yet they recognize is that the American has sacrificed so much in Vietnam. And when I heard that, my boss heard that, later on he introduced some of Vietnam veteran group that own business to go back to Vietnam and establish their business in Vietnam also. So I would like to see that happen because I know for sure the fighting men to the fighting men, and I see the way they hug. I think there is an opportunity to do not only the business, but also to do an understanding so they can be able to work and cooperate and also to excel. Because after all, I know many of them, their children looked up to American. And I myself, with Coca-Cola Company, we sponsor many of them. And it's time for us, if we think, and I appreciate all the sacrifice, but it's not the end of it. We need to go forward. And I need to see, and I can do anything I, I can do to help to bury the gaps. They're looking forward, and I know that many of us already done so. And, and that's opportunity. Just one more point, that this year, the bilateral trade between U.S. and Vietnam reached $30 billion. That's a lot of money. And I know that with sacrifice that you made, and now we move on. We, we hope to have a good life to our children. I think it's an opportunity to see some of that money come to us. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. I'll give you a round of words. And I want to make, to make sure you uh, have a copy of our book. Thank you so much.